The most exciting part of a vacation stay at a home rental? Easy. It's being greeted upon arrival with a rusted lockbox affixed to the underside of a stranger's condo. Yeah, you simply twist knobs, click gears, jiggle it, and then rip it off its moorings, and voila! Your prize is a key to a questionable home rental and maybe tetanus. When you just want to get your vacation started by actually getting into your room, it matters where you stay. At Hilton, we deliver your key right to your phone on the Hilton Honors app. Hilton, for the stay. This episode is brought to you by Shopify. Do you have a point of sale system you can trust, or is it <clears throat> a real POS? You need Shopify for retail. From accepting payments to managing inventory, Shopify POS has everything you need to sell in person. Go to shopify.com slash system, all lowercase, to take your retail business to the next level today. That's shopify.com slash system. I'm Susan Swain, host of C-SPAN's Q&A, where we spend an hour with nonfiction writers and historians who add context to today's news. In this episode of Q&A, James Tang discusses his new film, Ghost Mountain. It documents his father, Bunseng Tang's return to the site of a 1979 massacre of Cambodian survivors of Pol Pot's killing fields by Thai soldiers along the Thailand-Cambodian border. Bunseng, who survived both atrocities, settled in the United States as a refugee. Inside the once majestic country of Cambodia, after a decade of war, history witnessed the collapse of a horrific Khmer Rouge regime. It would end one of the worst genocides the world has ever seen. This memorial helps to ensure that the world never forgets those who died during the years of Cambodia's killing fields. Yet there is more to the story. There is the untold episode of the fate of tens and thousands of these survivors who sought refuge inside Thailand. This is my father, Bun Sang Tang, in a refugee camp in 1980. I knew since my childhood that my father was a survivor of the killing fields, but I was shocked to learn that he and many thousands of others faced a more terrifying atrocity. The massacre on the Temple Mountain called Pravi here. And my son, James, he never gave up. He always pushed me to tell him the story. And I always say to him, I said, I don't want to relive again, just don't, you know. So he just say, well, just, just tell me one time. So that's how we get here to do the documentary. James Tang, that is the opening of your new documentary, Ghost Mountain. Tell me about this project. Well, Ghost Mountain is a personal story of my father, as you just saw in that clip there, of the survival in the killing fields of Cambodia, which is a story that many of the later generations, like baby boomers, know very well about. It was considered the second Holocaust. But if you go down to the youth, it's really not in memory or existent. in sort of like the history that they're taught. So that's one thing we were trying to make up for. But what we're really focused on in this film is a story that nobody's really heard about, which is it's been lost and undocumented, which is a humanitarian crisis that happens after the fall of the Khmer Rouge 
1979. And things spiraled to really epic proportions. And my father, among many other refugees, find themselves in a huge, hor horrifying dystopia that really is a story that I think is important and everyone should hear. Your father uh, and you say in that opening clip that uh, for much of your childhood, he really wouldn't talk about his past, even though you pressed him many times. Why did he finally agree, do you think? It took a lot of persistence on my side. Um, one of the reasons why I personally wanted to do this story was I was coming of age from high school to college, and I had dealt with a sort of large challenge in my life. And I always knew my father was a survivor in his life. And they would watch the Killing Fields movie and he would make comments like, I've been through worse than that. Or there'd be times where I wouldn't finish my food and he'd say, you know, I would do anything in the world to eat that last bit of food there. And so he disciplined me in that way. And as I was coming of age, I really wanted to know more because I really saw a resilience in him. And I began to ask him, well, what exactly happened to you? And he, like he said, he didn't want to tell the story fully. And so I had to really try it. And what I did was I took some of my favorite authors like Eli Wiesel and said, these people told their stories. Eli Wiesel being his survival in concentration camp um, in, um, during the Holocaust. And so I said, he left an important mark for people to remember and he made a big impact and I would bring in articles and stuff and I just came back day after day and went after him for it and then one day he said okay I'll tell you a little bit and his idea was that he thought I would give up I would he, I would share enough for me it would sort of whet my appetite there and then I would just be good but I found his story incredible and I became sort of obsessed with it because I thought he lived sort of a one in a billion story where this is a survival tale that I've just never heard ever. So walk me through the sequencing from that conversation to the idea to do a documentary. Uh, when did that conversation happen and when did you decide I'm going to document this? I think I, being of my nature, I'm the type who was somebody who likes to write things down and chronicalize things. So I created a timeline. I went back very early on to his life, how he grew up. And I would find things like he had a very normal upbringing like me. I look at family photos. They'd play with toys, balls. They did basketball, kickball. They had rock and roll in Cambodia in their own ways. They had movie theaters. And so there were things like that that really wanted me to write this down and record it. And it just went on, it snowballed from there. And I don't want to spoil it, but at some point there was, later on the film, somebody who he connects with, who sort of is part of his story in Cambodia, where with that moment, um, we all collectively were like, I think we need to document this in sort of a film. And it's, it's important that we do this now before time is lost and before this sort of history is buried forever. Why do you think it's important for people, particularly an audience in the United States, to hear this story? I think um, for me, I wanted to tell this story because I, going back to his survival, and it gave me so much inspiration to persevere and have resilience. And for people today, I think this is something that you can um, put a high mark on where everyone's going through it in lumps, and I would like to show the indomitable will of the human spirit and determination. I think also I want to give tribute to a lot of the unsung heroes back then, the relief workers and the volunteers who did so much, they risked their careers, their lives. These are people from both the private NGOs and even the public. We have many State Department workers who um, really were overlooked afterwards. and. This is a part of history that I think we should really embrace in our American heritage because it's something we can celebrate because it tells us a lot of lessons of our compassion, our compassion, our empathy. Um, and this falls in the backdrop of the Vietnam War where nobody wanted to deal with that anymore. And 
we still have individuals who are really daring to do that. Had you ever made a film before? This is my first time, yeah. So how did you, um, how did you go about it? This is an enormous undertaking without any experience. Tell me how you, how you put it all together. Right. I'm, I'm originally from the financial services industry. And I, like I said, I had been documenting my story alongside when I was working for many, many years. And I would suppose that um, as uh, this more important piece of the story where an individual who is connected to my father's story comes into the picture, um, we had an opportunity to work with a co-producer who, who was brought in who was also very interested in this. And we, the expectation at the beginning was, let's sit down and film and interview them in a sunroom and hear what they had to say and sort of tease out what that story was and see where it goes. And <laughs> later on, that sort of snowballs and we get to, we're interviewing the next person in DC, the next person um, in North Carolina, and all, lo and behold, we're in, on the borders of Thailand and Cambodia at some point. And so it sort of took on a life of its own over time. I presume, I'm guessing from the way you just described that, is this the first time you'd ever been to Cambodia? This is probably the, that was the third time. Third time. Yeah, fourth time, I, I would say, actually. And I had to, I, w I want to add that, I had to, yeah, learn um, all the ropes that my co-producer taught me, Virginia Lynch Dean. And she had done a film prior called um, Under Our Skin about Lyme disease in Connecticut, primarily where it's focused on. And so I learned from first being behind the camera to editing here and there, um, to directing and people on the floor and setting out these sites. And so it's been a thrill. I've really enjoyed it, every part of it. How did you finance this project? Uh, we had our executive producer, um, um, who was involved intimately with the story at the beginning, um, financed a large portion of it. And then we also had um, donors, many of them from my fi father's clients, who um, my father was somebody who connected with his, he has his painting business. And so he paints a lot of the houses in Connecticut, in Southern Connecticut. And so he meets a lot of people and they always ask where he's from. And so he not only tells them he's from Cambodia, he's able to share his story. And he's able to make these really, I think, um, delicate and unique and really special connect relationships with people. And so we were fundraising and we sent it out and they were all um, so very generous and so very kind to help us and to fund this film out. Along the way, you created a nonprofit foundation. How does that mix into the production of the film? Right. This was done, yes, with a, with a, as a nonprofit. We really wanted this film to be educational. I wasn't looking to um, really do anything in terms of making big bucks or anything. Um, primarily, it's to show the younger, my, my cause was the younger generations. Um, I also had this longer term goal of creating a museum out of this. It was not just primarily this film. It was whatever would tell the story. And I thought the, the ultimate of that would be somewhere along where, along the border where this incident happened, there would be someday, which would be my goal, where I would create a museum that would sort of help tell the story physically in that location. Um, and would honor and uphold that memory and ensure that it wouldn't be lost. Well, you have graciously agreed to show the C-SPAN audience the majority of your documentary, and we're going to show it in large clips and then have you tell the story, uh, the backstory along the way. Before we begin our first one, which is almost 10 minutes in length, when exactly did you make the trip to Cambodia? Mm -hmm. That was approximately in 2016. So you've been working on this project for quite a few years now. It's been since 2014, July. Yeah. And, and when you went to I've been, Cam go ahead. I've been working on this story since 2010, so over 10 years. And when you traveled to Cambodia, how large was your entourage? Um, we had a crew of maybe eight, seven people at one point in time. Um, 
and when we and when you we, went there, did you have very specific goals in filming, or were you going to let the, the, it, see what you saw as you did with your interviews and let it um, um, build uh, as you went along? Yeah, that's a great one. We knew where we were going. We had planned it out um, precisely because we had only three weeks and only a limited time and budget. So we went straight for these areas where my father was and he hadn't been back in over 37 years, right, according to the film. And it's always uncertain because although we know the location and the place of where we're going, we don't know what's there, such as within that scene on the mountain. We had no idea what we'd capture. We had no idea how it would take place. And that, that was sort of the fun of the filmmaking process where you take what you're given, especially in documentary work, and it's your job as an artist and creator to rearrange that in such a way that really is evocative to the audience. Well, with that background, let's let the story unroll. We're going to be, begin uh, with the first 10 minutes of this documentary, Ghost Mountain. Let's watch. When I was a child, I never thought that I would leave the country. When I was in Cambodia, we had a great time before Poi Po time. We were playing ping pong, soccer, and playing games, and go out with the friends. I was the youngest of eight children. My family was very close. My dream was have a piece of land, build my own house with a pond and raise my own animals and have lots of kids. The market in Cambodia was full of good food. No one was starving before the war. My childhood, we were living outside of Phnom Penh. Phnom Penh was a very modern city. Growing up in Phnom Penh, I lived somewhat of a Western life with refrigerator and TV. Dotita Bootnam and my father only met recently. Her story parallels his in many ways. At that time, TV was turning from black and white to color and rock and roll came in. So I was exposed to the English language at a very early age. I grew up with Mick Jagger and the Beatles, as well as the Cambodian music scene. And then the war came in, and uh, the war really stopped life uh, for me. In cooperation with the armed forces of South Vietnam, attacks are being launched this week to clean out major enemy sanctuaries on the Cambodian-Vietnam border. This is not an invasion of Cambodia. This began years of intensified bombing campaigns. From 1970 to 1973, the U.S. dropped more bombs on Cambodia's heartland than were dropped on Japan during the Second World War equivalent to five Hiroshima's. To escape from the bombing, my family fled west to the countryside near the Thai border. The American bombing caused great instability, enabling the communist Khmer Rouge, once a small faction, to gain power. Its leader, Pol Pot, envisioned an agrarian revolution. aim to wipe out everything he determined to be modern. When the country fell to the Khmer Rouge in 1975, its army purged the cities and committed atrocities on an unbelievable scale. When we were forced out of Phnom Penh, my father told me everything is going to be okay. And that's the last time I remember my father. 
Seven million people were forced into labor camps. They told us, this is your place. You got to build your own house and you got to grow your own thing to uh, feed yourself. When my father got sick, I tried to go and get to visit him, and I got captured by the Khmer Rouge, and I was tortured for 40 days. It's all mass killing, and, and they take all our food, so we were starving, no medical care, so people were just dying from all that. Between 1975 and 1979, one-third of Cambodia's population was either executed or tortured and starved to death. The genocide would become known as the Killing Fields. The Khmer Rouge were killing off all the people from the city and it was coming close to my village, and they stopped. And the reason was there was a coup d'etat in Phnom Penh. On Christmas Day, 1978, communist Vietnamese troops invaded Phnom Penh, forcing Pol Pot out of power. In the chaos that followed, forsaken and starving Cambodians fled towards the border with neighboring Thailand. We have to make the escape because the chance of surviving in another communist regime is very low for all of us. After the concentration camp, I reunited with my father, and my father told me that we have to get out of the country right away because we don't know the situation in the country. We have to get out now. We make an ox cart. <laughs> we make our own wheel from scratch. We prepare this for a three months journey. As refugees began to mass on the border of Thailand, a group of frontline international aid workers scrambled to help. Oh, it's so. We were disappointed there wasn't more public outcry. I mean, this was a major human rights violation. It was just us trying to whip the Western press into some attention on this. The Thai press covered it, if at all, barely. After this period, the Thai government worried that Vietnamese agents would penetrate their borders. Without adequate assistance to manage the stampede, they were reluctant to allow refugees to cross into Thailand. The U.S. was kind of sitting uh, empty-handed, you know, while well, we didn't have a, a large refugee program. Lionel sought help from McAllen Thompson, who had been working with refugees in Laos and Vietnam. In the spring of 1979, you know, it sort of doubled up the problems on the Thai government with all these very large numbers of people coming in, illegal aliens, and essentially starving. It looked like people you know, coming right out of Auschwitz. What are they going to do with them? Skin and bones, many of them, and many died on the way. By the time my father made it to the border, the Thai government had agreed to allow some survivors to be brought into makeshift border camps. We escaped that day with thousands of people that poured into the border. And I remember before they put us in the camp, they bring the, the trucks to the border and have us get on the trucks. And the truck drove through the city of Iran Patel. And it's the first time that we saw electricity. And we are so happy. I 
We all threw our fish up to the air. It's freedom, it's freedom, it's freedom. And we couldn't believe our luck. Our spirit was high, we were hopeful. I mean, we have been cut off from the world for four and a half years. So, we make it to the refugee camp, surrounded with a barbed wire. But one of the best times that I had with my family, we feel that we're not being killed or starving again. And every day we enjoy every moment at the refugee camp there. We play music, we talk to friends, we talk about the past and about the new future. watching segments of the documentary Ghost Mountain with its uh, producer, James Tang, who is talking to us uh, from New York City by Zoom. James, there's so many questions, but we really don't have l- lots of time. Uh, but let me ask you uh, uh, just about, uh, from a political standpoint, um, how have you and how have your father processed U.S. policy during that period and its impact on, on, on Cambodia? Yeah, I one of the portions of the story that we really had to tell was the impact that war policy and um, foreign policy can have and the collateral damage. This was a war, like what happened in Cambodia was really an outspill of Vietnam where Kissinger and Nixon illegally bombed Cambodia. And it's something that you would never imagine where a neutral country just gets really splintered from it and goes into a civil war and a revolution. Um, so for myself and my father, I, I can, we can speak of really the, the mixed feelings where he, he didn't know that the U.S. was bombing. He had only known of Pol Pot and the regime. Um, and he wouldn't know of this history until he came to the U.S. But for him, he felt the, the, life-saving efforts that people made on these refugee camps, he knew they were directly from the international community of the Westerners. So he's always had um, sort of a, he's always felt admiration for for the U.S. and what they did. Um, I think it's a very complicated area. For me, I I want to continue the story because it's, it's a very important story to tell, like, what are we doing overseas and the type of wars and places we're getting involved. And how how often do we do that and to what limit? And we have to not only count the cost, but we have to know of the stories in the people's lives that are really changed from this. What kind of permission did you need from the Cambodian or Thai governments to do your filming? We had to go and we had to do our normal um, film licensing there that you have rights to film within the country. Every location, you also have to ask for rights if you want to film in the capital city or in Phnom Penh, um, that's Phnom Penh, or in Angkor Wat. Um, for, this, for the locations in the refugee camps on the Thai Cambodian border, we had to work with the border soldiers there. And we had friends who knew, who were good friends with some of the generals there. And we were very fortunate in that. And we were able to get really, uh, they were able to escort us in and get us really footage that's never been taken within that area. Were you surprised that they were welcoming of your telling of the story? For some part, yeah. Um, I think they find, they they themselves know some of the story and they go through there and they do morning um, patrols. And so when they find that people from the past are coming there and wanting to film, it sort of got them excited and they were like, wow, this region can really become a, um, a little bit more, uh, can get more attention and we can get more people coming here. So that for them was for personally rewarding on their side. Where did you find all of that vintage footage that you use? A lot of it was, um, a lot of it was donated by the Red Cross 
uh, International Red Cross, um, a lot of news organizations in France, they had archives as well. World Health Program, uh, World Hunger Program as well. Uh, there's some that they, the AP that we had to also license for and use. And we were, we were very fortunate, really. A lot of this time, people went there and there were journalists who documented this period very well. And I think that comes from Vietnam, which was one of the first televised wars. And so when Cambodia had their incidences there, there were many people who had cameras with them. And that's allowed us to use that and tell, help, help us tell the story in a really uh, dignified manner. It's only a kick. A jump. A block. It's only a serve. It's only a tackle. A run. It's only for the fans. After all, it's only pressure. You got this. Adidas. So last question before we go back and watch our next segment of this. How did you find Theda Boot Mom, who will be in throughout this documentary, um, and why did she agree to sit down in front of your cameras? Yeah, she's a very important character, and um, she had grown up in Cambodia um, to a, a Lanel diplomat, I would say. So she was very educated, spoke English. Um, she had someone, when she came to the U.S., wrote her book, um, To Destroy You Is No Loss. And so when, in my early days when I was researching, I had read that book. And it was mainly focused on the killing fields of Cambodia, the genocide. But there was one chapter devoted to this story at Pravi here, which um, goes through every single detail that my father talked about. And this was a time where there was nothing I could find on it. So when we were doing the film, I made sure to reach out to her on Facebook, the world today with social media. And she agreed. She said, um, she said, I have to tell this story. I'm so thankful for it as well. And should anything she, I needed, she was, uh, um, she was willing to help with it. Well, let's return to the documentary and see the story unfold. By June 1979, the Thai government became impatient with the pace of Western action and threatened to force refugees back into Cambodia. As the population along the border grew, the Thai became increasingly apprehensive. None of us could get round the fact that this was becoming a very inconvenient problem for our political masters. It was, you know, showing no signs of abating. The numbers amassing on the border in the border camps. Very rapidly, when it became evident that this was going to be a major uh, uh, humanitarian uh, disaster, that people came forward and were mobilized very quickly. But it was not a pretty sight. There was resettlement going on. Buses would come, people would leave, but even then you weren't sure they'd be processed. You didn't know where they would go or what would become of them. And for most of the people, they didn't know if they were going to get resettled. They lived with constant anxiety over this. Uh, and we also didn't know. And in fact, we were being told that everybody was going to be pushed back to Cambodia you know, any day now. We were out there constantly trying to identify those closest to the U.S. and send them off to other camps away from the border. My father's happy interlude in the border camp was short-lived. One day, rescue workers arrived with buses and began calling out names. Some Muslim Cham people came down to say goodbye to us. Then we were celebrating with them by saying the Buddhist expression, let it be. May they reach their destination with happiness. Then after that, they departed with the buses one after another. 
We were thinking, oh, when will be our turn to leave? June 12 or 13, early in the morning, I remember, the bus arrived at the long side refugee camp, and the Western people came with a microphone on their head, and they called people by name that to get on the buses. The scene was just tension-filled from the time we arrived that morning. And they keep calling, and then more and more people get on the bus. Refugees were surging towards the front of this enclosure. And I keep waiting for my, my name being called. And we would try to call out the names, but it was very chaotic. We only had about three hours to do this. By midday, we were told we had to finish. In fact, several times the Thai would say, you're done. And we'd say, no, we just need a few more minutes. The Thai soldier in common came down and shut them down and pushed them out of the refugee camp, not allowed them to uh, call the name anymore, and they closed the gate. After permitting the relief workers to relocate just a few thousand refugees, Thai soldiers cut off the rescue and forced a desperate mob, my father among them, back into the camp. So uh, did you ever learn whether or not the Thai military acted alone or under orders from the government? From what I've heard after interviews, um, that the Thai kingship was very embarrassed. It sounded like that. And many in the Thai government didn't, um, were somewhat remorseful about what happened. And so it did seem like this was a act that was done really within the Thai military, maybe at the top echelons, or where that's more likely where it came from, but it was not a good thing. It was not a good look for the kingship itself. And you sort of see that where this remorse where refugees who had survived or had gone there were accepted back in afterwards, um, particularly who went through this ordeal. This is a moment, I think, for you to talk about the international aid workers and the role they play in situations like this. What did you come away from this project thinking about the jobs that these people do? It's really unappreciated and thankless what some of these champions of refugees have done. Um, each one of these interviews I've done with them, I've been so impressed with the character and really the courage that they had to risk at all. They were risking their careers to go out to Thailand, Cambodia, uh, Lionel Rosamont being one of these individuals. And, and many times their, their lives were at peril as well. This was a region that was very much erupting with lots of different disasters happening. And you could really sense that these people committed themselves to a higher cause than themselves. And I think it's something that really impresses me um, day to day as well. And it's for them that I really can sit here and speak with you as well. And the sole reason why I'm now living in the United States. And that was one of their big reasons for doing this was because they believed truly that the refugee could succeed in the United States if given the chance. So before we return to your documentary, uh, almost 40 years later, you took that same trip with your father and uncle up to the mountain. What was the topography like today as you made that journey? The region is still very much full of jungles, and there are still landmines there. They have now demarcated where the landmines are, but there's so little funding to pulling them out that they're all in that region. You can see all the signs with the skulls and stuff. Um, as we go into the mountain itself, you will find that everything's still there, like it was back 37 years ago. So we went with soldiers, and you'll see this in the film in a little bit, 
who just rushed into the to the paths down at the mountain showing us and scouring to show us what was there and they would pull out out of the ground what we thought were leaves and suddenly it'd be clothes it'd be pots and pants things left behind the refugees and it shocked me like how well preserved it was all these artifacts were in the jungle and this was only at the top we weren't allowed to go down to the bottom where where the landmines were where most of the things had happened so I was really stunned by the whole thing. And for me, it was like reliving history because I have spent so much time documenting this. And to actually be there in person and having this personal story, it just layered all on top. And it just really came alive for me through there. So the story is at this point, a 43,000 Cambodian refugees at the top of this mountain where there's temple is in Thailand and uh, at the hands of the Thai military in 1979. And let's watch as we return to the documentary about what happened next. And when we got there, we don't know where we are. And they forced us out from the bus at gunpoint, and they told us where to go. And we found out that we are on top of the mountain called Prabhidhir Mountain. Almost four decades later, I accompany my father and my uncle to visit what remains at the site of the Prabhidhir Massacre. It's very difficult to walk through here. We follow the track that everybody went. On the top of the mountain, the Thai soldiers told us that whatever we have, water, money, gold, water boat, just give it to them. And they say, you're not going to need it down there. Uh, just drop it in the bucket and give it to them. As you can see, the cliff is so steep down. And they keep gunning us down. We have no way to get down. We have to hold, hold the wire to, get, to lower ourselves down. Clip by clip. When we helped the old people, they fell down. We crashed into the branches. In agony, they dropped all the things they carried with them, and they abandoned a lot of their belongings there. That night, every five minutes, we heard boom. And everyone was crying. People appeared with blood all over their body, some of their eyeballs falling out. Broken skulls, screaming, looking for their mother and father. You know, I lived through the Khmer Rouge. I thought that was bad. But that night was the worst night of my life. And I hear the bullet go through my ear, like, right behind from my ears. And um, I saw a little girl in front of me. The bullet hit her head, and she collapsed. I hold on to my mom's hand, and my thought was, at least we die together as a family. They want us to walk on those landmines, and then very few survive, and it would make a good lesson that we will never come back to Thailand. They want to kill as many refugees as they can. So walking 40,000 refugees through the deepest mountain with no water and with gun behind us, that's one way to kill people. And they don't have to open fire because the landmine will do the job. The brush is so thick. We heard the planes, the sound of planes flying through. We thought someone come to help us. 43,000 of refugees cry out for help. 
but no one come for us. <laughs> Everyone was falling. All of us fell to the ground. And then in a moment, I gained my consciousness. I saw blood on my hands. All here was broken, my right and my left. This might be a blanket here. Yeah. For the UN to give it to us. And sometimes they use that to cover the body because the body is all yeah. They wrap the body and just let it sit and rot it. When my wife and daughter died, I couldn't take the bodies with us because I was injured. I couldn't walk. My arm was hit by a landmine. My nephew carried me, put me on a rice bag hammock, carried me and took a month with no food. At the place where my wife was struck by landmines, 14 people died. The strong men that carried rice and carried supplies ran to seek water to cook rice and other things. Then the landmines exploded. And when it exploded, they all died. And the people that didn't have food ran to grab the bloody rice off of the dead bodies just to have something to eat. They had to wash the blood off the rice and cook it. Thousands of refugees passed through here. 13,000 lost their life. This is all they left behind. I lived through Poi Pot for almost four years. I was detained, put in a concentration camp, tortured. But to live through property here for that three months' time is worse, worse than you could even imagine. For 30 something years, I still have a nightmare, nights after night. Somehow that nightmare never go away. James Tang, we're watching your documentary, Ghost Mountain, or the story of your father and his survival through this story of massacre and survival. So the death toll was a 13,000. The remarkable thing is that so many people actually survived that assault. How do, how do you think they did that? Well, the that death rate, is or casualty rate um, is something the CIA came up with, but we're not completely sure. And I don't know if they were as well. It was a fair estimate of what really happened out there. As to how did people survive it, it's incredible. And um, many people would be up there for days and weeks at a time um, trying to survive on whatever was there. So you heard the story of people picking off the rice there are people who were finding anything scouring the forest for food. Um, people also, the refugees, as they made their way down to the bottom, were able to find the Vietnamese soldiers at the other side of the minefield. And so the Vietnamese helped demine it in, in order to help some of these refugees get out, my father being included as one of them. Um, and then there were also a series of other refugees that were still caught up there that um, rescue workers in the State Department had to go and negotiate rescue out for them as well. I think it's, uh, the, yeah, go ahead, I'm sorry. It's just incredible to, to be in that type of forest with little um, provisions and water. It's something that was just in such limited supply. My uncle once told me off the side that he had uh, buckets of water that he had carried from the bottom of the river to the top 
and people were giving him gold, like bars of gold for just a bucket of water, all their life savings with them. And it was really desperate times and a huge despair. And people were willing to do anything to survive just one more day. I think the the thing that watching that uh, that and knowing that's your father that you're standing next to, I'm sure everyone on the film crew was affected by the emotional experience. But what was it like for you as a son watching the pain of your father reliving through that? To see my father go through that and really dredge up the demons of his past, I felt a lot of admiration and courage for what he did to really carry the burden of the story for decades and decades and holding it with them and going out there and confronting it in, in Thailand and Cambodia, right in front of the camera. And so I've been left with um, really in awe of my father and the bravery he took to tell this story. And I give him a lot of props for that. I think living through it is one thing, but to come from, a society and a, a culture which is honor and shame where many of the survivors cambodian survivors have decided to not talk about this to stuff it away to move on my father has taken another approach and he's he's dealt with it and managed it in a different way and so i've i've really seen my father in a really different light because of all of that And now we'll return to a final portion of the documentary Ghost Mountain, where uh, Bun Sen Tang makes his way to the United States for a new life as a Cambodian refugee in America. My father and I walked through the jungle for three months. When we got on a small city, I found my my brother Chiu, and we settled down. And my father keep telling me that you have to leave and go back and escape again. I say, how could I escape again? I mean, after all we lived through and been through, my father say, you're still young. You still have opportunity. It's not safe to be here. And I say, what about you? He say, just leave. So I was very upset when he wanted me to leave him. And I left him. Without, without saying goodbye to him. While we escaped back into Thailand three months later, and fortunately, this time I got rescued. The Western person that come and rescue me put me in a minivan. And when the minivan drove away from that campsite, I broke down. I never cried that hard in my life that I was safe. And a month later, I received a letter from my brother that my father passed away. <laughs> this time, they took me to uh Legal refugee camp called Boriram. <laughs> and when we reach Boriram, we celebrate because now we are legal refugee. And to me, that was a gift. To me, that was a second life. So um, I made it. Today I'm a painter, I have more than I can imagine. And I kind of like to become a painter because i able to travel to different places, meet different people, and sit back and look at 
the work that I done and I take pride in what I did. One thing that I wished for for many years was to be able to say thank you to the people who saved me. I did not know their name. One day, while painting a house, that wish came true, and the seed for this film was sown. It turned out that the homeowner was renovating the house for his stepfather, Bob Devecki. Doug came into the room and, and introduced me to Boon Zhang. I'm Seiki. <laughs> I said, that's a man that I'm looking for for all these years. I, I mean my hero. <laughs> Cultural values are the core principles. My father, mother, uncles, and aunts have come a long way from the killing fields. And while they take pride in passing on their culture, they're most proud to call themselves Americans. Ladies and gentlemen, once again, a big hand for them, please. Thank you. Happy New Year, you guys. When I'm in Cambodia, I talk to a lot of young people, and I always ask them, I say, did you hear about the pushback of the refugee on the Bravi Hill Mountain? Nine out of ten, none of them know about it. They never heard about it. All those educated people was killed, and the country just started over again now. And it, it will take a long time to catch up to the other world. So James Tang, did your relationship with your father change as a result of this project? Yeah, I got to see my father, as I said, in a different light. We, I've grown closer with him and um, really see him as more than the father I saw growing up. I, now I see somebody who not only has survived what I thought was one ordeal, I've seen him really survive. Um, so much more, which is a, he survived a concentration camp and also this massacre in, amongst and all of that. So he's been more than a superhero for me. He's, he's all of it combined. And um, I take great strength in all the things he's done for me growing up, but also all of that he's done right now, which is to tell this story um, on behalf of myself and all the people who survived as well. The Cambodian diaspora in the United States is up to about 300,000 people. Uh, and you say that many people don't really know their own history. What do you want to do with this project? How do you hope to go forward? I'd like to continue sharing this and showing it to the community, both the Southeast Asian community, the Cambodians as well. Um, as for many of the youth who have parents who survived through this, they don't know anything really. Their parents are really mum about it. So I hope to continue to show this both on West Coast and the East Coast. And if they can find me out, they can find me at pvfund.org to follow the film. We have our Facebook and Instagram up there as well. Do you plan or hope to show it in Thailand and Cambodia? At some point. A lot of things are up in the air right now with COVID and um, all of the sort of restrictions in travel. We, we intended the whole time to be able to take it around in Phnom Penh particularly and maybe in Siem Reap where Angkor Wat is in due time. And, uh, and you told me when we were talking beforehand that you also had the hope of doing uh, making a museum. Tell me about your, your hopes for that. Right now it's sort of it abstractly in my head, but the – we. Do, we have seen areas along this mountain site where there could be a museum placed there. And it'd be something that would sort of take the things that are there in the mountain and really show a case for people because never will pe tourists or any bit faster buyers be able to go through that mountain. It's just very dangerous. And it's, these rock outcroppings are very steep. 
and maybe the museum would function to as a guided tour to show what it was like to be a refugee background whether it's going down this staircase and it feels like you're going grabbing onto these mines and stuff it would be sort of this interactive type of experience and we would also curate things from that site right next there to show it um, that's going to be a long range project of mine that i'm going to continue to kick around my head and um and see what comes to light of it one of these days. We have one minute left. So uh, did you ever envision back in 2010 when you started this, that this would change your life so much? Mm, I'm not sure. I'm not sure what I was thinking back then. I really just wanted to tell the story and get as many places as possible. I am really happy with the reception and the people have been able to see it thus far. And whether whether it continues to change my life, one of the things I've taken great gratitude in what this film has done for me is really helped me understand my history. But it's really um, helped me rub shoulders with people of like high esteem, these refugee rescue workers, and I hope to really take part of that and really um, carry that forward with me and share that with others as well. The documentary is called Ghost Mountain. James Tang is the co-producer, and it is the story of his father and uncle and thousands of other Cambodians who survived a massacre in Thailand in 1979. Thank you so much for spending an hour with C-SPAN. Thank you, Susan, so much for your time as well. Really, my team and I really appreciate all this. Thanks for listening to C-SPAN's Q&A. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts, and you'll never miss an episode. And while you're there, please take a minute to rate and review us. You can also send us an email at podcasts at c-span.org with your questions, comments, or ideas. Your feedback is welcome.